chapter 9. Even before the fighting began, Americans were afraid that they were not getting the war off to a good start. In an emergency, Americans had always declared a national day of prayer to make sure that God understood that they needed his special help. But when the people asked Madison to declare such a day, he said it was unconstitutional. The governor couldn't tell people to pray. Finally, at the instance of Congress, Madison did write a pro pro proclamation. But he worded it with care. He invited societies so disposed to offer at one and, and the same time their common vows even though the results may have been the same madison was not interfering with the people's religious freedom but when the fighting actually started it was obvious that the country did need help no one could depend upon the generals two generals assigned to take key points in canada's turned tail and ran before even going into battle. At Detroit, General William Hall, with an army of 2,500, surrendered to a tiny British force, less than, a, less than 700. Without firing a shot, Hall's own men were so mad they threatened to shoot him, Newspapers called him a booby, and the army court marshaled him with the recommendation that he be shot. Madison certainly didn't want him anywhere near a battle again. But why shoot him? He rejected the recommendation. Then there was the case of General Smith. In an attempt to take Fort Erie, he loaded his men into boats and sent an advanced boat to the fort, demanding that the British surrender. As was to be expected, the British refused. So what did General Smith do? He unloaded his boats and called off the battle. It was as if he thought it would be rude to argue with the enemy. And down went another general. In the midst of these failures, Madison had to run for re-election. Eldridge Gary of Massachusetts was running as his vice president. Naturally, the Federalists blamed Madison for everything that went wrong. The war shouldn't have been started, they said. It shouldn't be fought. It couldn't have been start. It couldn't have been won. Get rid of Madison. But the Federalists didn't have anyone to run against. Madison, so they backed an anti-war Republican. DeWitt Clinton. Everyone knew that if a military Madison lost, it would not only be a political defeat, but also a military one. And far more serious than the downfall of two generals, Madison knew it's two, but he never said a word to promote his election. The people would have to decide for themselves, he said, and they did. Soon after the beginning of the new year, 1813, the votes were finally all counted. Madison had 127 elections votes. Clinton, 89, Madison would stay in the president's mansion. And in spite of threats of secession in New England, the Union was still intact. The war would go on, but it did need good men to fight it.
Madison, who always had trouble firing people, finally accepted the res resignation of his Secretary of War. But the new Secretary, John Armstrong, was no better. Although he kept looking for good generals, Madison had little luck. The one man who would become the hero of this war had not yet been discovered. As it turned out, America did much better at sea than the land, which was a surprise. Congress had consistently opposed spending much money to build up a navy. How could Americans hope to stop the British at sea? The British Navy was so huge, it had three warships for every American gun. Yet, in the early days of the war, three American ships defeated, captured, or destroyed three British, British vessels. Of course, Americans' ships did not win every battle, but the reason they were so successful was that they fought differently. When the British fired their guns, they aimed at the mast of enemy ships to disable them. When the Americans fired, they aimed right at the waterline to sink them. The most spectacular victory of the war came in September 1813, when Captain Oliver Perry captured an entire British squadron on Lake Eric. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner, one sloop, his message to the commander general of the area has become famous in American history. We have met the enemy and they are ours, he reported. Madison received the news at Montpelier, where he was recovering for such a serious bilious attack that the country feared he would die. John Adams a firm supporter of Madison, said that Perry's victory should be enough to revive Madison if he were in the last stage of consumption. And indeed, when he returned to Washington, he was described as being game as ever. But much had happened over the last year. Americans had taken Detroit had won a number of battles in Canada, and on April 27th, they had seized the village of York, new, now called Toronto. As it happened, York had burned to the ground soon after its capture, and although Americans had not done this, Canadians and the British blamed them for it. In revenge, they began burning American towns, Buffalo, Lewiston, Maine, and towns near Annapolis. British admired Cockburn, whose name rhymes with Goburn, threatening to wa march right into Washington and burn down the president's house. This sounded like an enemy bluster, even though a British pride gate had been insured at the mouth of Potomac River since May 1813. Still, there was a, also hope for peace. Russia had offered a negotiation between England and the United States. And although England had not as yet replied to the invitation on May 9, 1813, Madison sent two delegates to Russia, ready to talk if, if England was willing. Payne Todd accompanied the delegates as his secretary. Although he was not enthusiastic about going, a still handsome, still 
irresponsible, still a playboy. He was slated to go to Princeton, but Dolly and James thought a job and a year abroad would have a settling effect on precious pain. Perhaps it might lead to a diplomatic career. At least it might make a man of, out of him. It did neither. After a few months in Russia, Payne slipped off to Paris to enjoy himself in his own way. Since he seldom wrote home, Dolly worried, but at the same time tried to find excuses for him at just as she always had. It was not until the end of the year 1813 that England rejected Russia's office. offer. She wanted no intermediary if she was going to negotiate. She would do it directly. And, arrange and arrangements were made accordingly. Yet there seemed to be no change in England's attitude, nor any great desire to promote peace. Not even after England and France ended their war in March 1814. Surely with France out of the way, Americans thought England would be more willing to come to terms with the United States. On the other hand, England was free now to unleash her full force against the United States. If that's what she wanted, Americans could only go on fighting. The trouble was that not even Madison felt the Secretary of war john armstrong was doing his best why foreign stance would anyone give two generals who were known to hate each other a joint command yet armstrong did he ordered th these two generals to take montreal and when the campaign failed he didn't tell madison the exact truth about what happened. He often did not tell the exact truth. He often gave orders behind the president's back without his knowledge. Sometimes he didn't even let the pre president see his own mail. He just went ahead and answered, saying whatever he wanted. When Madison discovered what Armstrong had been doing, he told him straight out how much he disapproved of his actions, but he didn't fire him. Perhaps he had no one to replace him. Perhaps he hoped the repined would change Armstrong. It didn't. Indeed, Armstrong seemed to have no regard for President's opinion, when Madison began predicting that the city of Washington was in danger, Armstrong paid no attention. As early as May 24th, 1814, Madison was warning of an attack, but Armstrong did nothing. In June, when British Admiral, Admiral Cockburn was already destroying property along Chesapeake, Bay. Madison insisted that the city should be getting ready to defend itself. Secretary Armstrong scoffed at the idea. Finally, in desperation, Madison created a spe special military district around Washington. He gave the command to a general winder with the recommendation that 10,000 men be called up to defend the area and the special units be set up to supply armies and ammunition secretaries winder 
and it seemed the president itself. When the president's orders more ordered more men to be called up, Armstrong sent Winder his own order, which called far, for far fewer men. He sent his own order by regular mail, and it didn't reach Winder for 22 days, even on August 18th, when 51 British warships and transports were reported at the mouth of nearby Patuxent River. Armstrong refused to be alarmed. Why would the British both bother with Washington, he asked. Baltimore was a much more likely target, but the British headed for Washington. Armstrong, however, remained so casual, it was no wonder that blunders were made. Everything went wrong. Troops that should have been together were separated. The road that the enemy was using should have been blocked, and wasn't both Winder, Winder and Madison himself had ordered that trees and and every barricade available be laid across the road? Nothing was done. Later, a British lieutenant said that if they their way had been blocked, they would have surrendered. Winder, it turned out, was in a, as inefficient as Armstrong, was deceitful and stubborn. For four days, James Madison rode about trying to patch up the mistakes of one and uncover the deliberate mischief of the other. His small, gallant, 64-year-old president, who couldn't have shouted to the troops if he wanted to, suddenly found himself not only the commander-in-chief in name, but actually needed to take charge on the field. Even so, he probably didn't assert himself as strongly as he might have. He was not a Napoleon, nor could he turn himself into one overnight. But he drove himself hard on August 22nd, when the citizens of Washington began abandoning the cities to seek safety. Madison ordered the state's papers, the letters of President Washington, the delegates of independence, and the Constitution removed to Virginia. Armstrong said there was no need to do this. Why panic? Like her husband, Dolly was taking no chances. She sent her pet parrot to the house of French ambassadors, where she thought he'd be safe. James left to be with the army, such as it was, Com camped nine miles to the east. Would Dolly be afraid to stay the, in the mansion for a night or two until he was able to return? James asked. Dolly was not the least bit afraid. She was just mad at the idea of British soldiers tramping into the president's mansion, knocking around her lovely things, breaking them, stealing them, and perhaps setting fire to the house itself. James told her she should get ready for the worst. Pack up his personal papers and have them put in the carriage, but no personal belongings, he said. He stationed a hundred men as guard around the house, and off he went. For the next two days, Dolly packed papers, four crates of them, and stationed herself at the upstairs window with her. Spyglasses upstairs window with her spyglasses to watch the hordes of people streaming out of the city, and because she needed someone to talk to, 
she wrote her sister Lucy a breathless letter. A few words now, a few letters as she jumped up to look at the window or to take care of another task. Our private property must be sacrificed, she wrote. I am determined not to leave myself until I see Mr. Madison safe. My friends and acquaintances are all gone. But Dolly could not bear to part with all her private property. Perhaps at the least minute, minute she could find, perhaps at the last minute she could find a wagon to take an extra trunk or two. In any case, she packed some clothes, surely some turbans, the silverware, a few books, and her favorite clock. And she certainly wasn't going to leave those beautiful red velvet four dollar a yard draper, draperies for the British. So she yanked them down and packed them too. On August 23rd, Madison questioned two British soldiers who had deserted. Yes, they said. The British were planning to attack Washington. Even now, Armstrong was not convinced. Maybe Annapolis, he said, not Washington. But Madison no longer had any patience with Secretary Armstrong. He wrote an urgent message to Dolly. Dolly reported to her sister, He desires that I should be ready at any a moment's notice to leave the city. That evening, Madison arrived back at the man back at the mansion. He knew it would be a brief visit, and it turned out it was both brief and interpreted. At dusk, an officer arrived, explaining that the army needed arms and ammunition. Nation. Madison sent him to Armstrong, but heard, as it is to believe, the uncorkable Armstrong told the officer it was too late to open the storehouse, and closed the door in his face. At nine o'clock, General Winder came to report on the position of the troops. Twenty-five thousand camped near the Navy Yard at Washington. 25,000 at Blendensburg, a village just east of Washington, which the British would have to pass through in order to reach the capital. To have the army divided this way was not good news. At midnight, an urgent message was delivered to the President from the Secretary of State, James Monroe. The enemy are in full march on Washington, the message read. James and Dolly j jumped out of bed, and when, and with spy glasses in hand, they rushed up to the roof where they would have a better view. Nothing yet. At dawn, Madison was offering again, first to the Navy Yard, and then to Blendensburg where the battle would take place. Often during the long day, Dolly must have wondered about the mansion, S excuse me, saying goodbye to one room after another. What she most hated leaving was the at full length portrait of George Washington. But there it was, nailed to the wall. She did manage to secure a wagon, and everything had been stowed in it. She had only to wait. She continued her little letters to Lucy. Three o'clock, will you believe it, my sister? We have had a battle or skirmish near Blendensburg, and I am still here within the sound of cannon. Mr. Madison comes not. May God protect him.
Hardly had she finished writing this when an army officer galloped up with a message from the president that Dolly should leave at once. Madison sent instruction as to where they would meet, but now, at the last minute, Dolly knew that she would not leave. President Washington's portrait behind. She ordered a servant to bring an axe and break the frame, taking the portrait out of the frame. She had it put in a wagon. She knew she would be one of the last to leave the city, but still she took another minute to scribble down a final word to Lucy. It is done when I shall again write you or where I shall be tomorrow. I cannot tell. She certainly could not tell. Dolly and James never did meet at the appointed place. Instead, they fumbled through Virginia in the dark night, looking for each other while behind them the sky blazing with reflections of the city on fire. At nine o'clock in the evening, the British had marched to the capital. Building seated themselves. Building seated themselves in the House of Representatives, and in high good humor had voted anonymously to burn down the city, and they proceeded to do so, going from public building to public building, pilling up wood works and furniture furniture, and then setting it all aflame. They reached the President's Mansion about 10.30. Admiral Cockburn was in the lead, very much pleased with himself for carrying out his threat with such a palm, seeing diner laid out on the dining room table. He sat down, raised a glass of wine, and proposed a toast to James Madison's health. Hear, hear, his man men would have responded, just as del delighted as he was to be where they were, doing what they were doing. Then they began ransacking the house, picking up souvenirs as they went, rhinestoning buckles, a medicine chest, a sword, a red velvet cushion, one of Madison's shirts, a package of his love letters, one of his hats for the admiral. When they left, each had a lighted torch in his hand. Once outside, they tossed them through the open windows, cheering at the flames caught, spreads, spread, and enveloped the mansion. The next morning, they might have continued their destruction, except for a lucky accident. The weather, which so often decided the, the fates of the battle, let loose a giant hurricane on the city. Of course, the British had storms in England, but these soldiers had soon nothing like this. This was a raging, terrifying affair that bent Mr. Jefferson Jefferson's popular trees on Pennsylvania Avenue to the ground, sent house roofs flying, knocking down walls, lifted up cannons, and killed 30 British soldiers. People had to lie down on the ground to keep the wind from picking them up and carrying them away. There was something eerie about it, as if the British had gone too far and were being punished. In any case, they decided they'd had enough, and as soon as the storm let up the 
a little, they returned to their ships. The damage, however, had been done. The Battle of Blandensburg had been lost, needlessly, so the Americans' officers claimed and they informed Madison that they would not serve one hour longer under Secretary of War Armstrong. So Armstrong finally offered his res resignation, and Madison gave the double job of Secretary of State and Secretary of War to James Monroe. As presidents began returning to Washington, Dolly and James met Dolly's sister Anna's house. Anna and her family, who were now living in Washington, invited the Madisons to stay. It was a gloomy place. Washington, everyone was heart sick to see the black ended buildings and skeletons of the president's mansion and the capital reduced to a pile of rubble. But no one felt worse than James Madison himself. One group of citizens decided that there was no point in fighting England any longer. They went to Madison and began begged began to beg him to surrender. Never, he said, other felt they should at least move the capital to Philadelphia. No, Madison refused to give the British the satisfaction of thinking Americans could be chased out of their capital city. Not everyone felt like giving up. Many all over the country were more determined than ever to beat the British. From all of the surrendering states, volunteers poured into what appeared to be the next target, Baltimore. On September 11th, Admiral Cochrane landed his fleet 14 miles below Baltimore. But the Americans were ready, this time with a competent general. They quickly drove back the British forces that had landed. Then, when the British ships turned their guns on Baltimore, Fort McHenry, the Americans stood firm through a 24-hour bombardment. In the end, the British retired in confusion. A young American lawyer, Francis Scott Key, acting as a messenger for Madison, was held overnight on one of the British ships. From its deck, he watched the entire battle and was so thrilled, especially at the sight of the American flag. At the dawn's early night, that he wrote the Star-Spangled Banner. And of course, Americans have been celebrated the Fort McHenry victory ever since. The news for Baltimore electrified the nation, particularly those in Washington whose pride had been hurt and whose confidence had been shaken. Yet the good news didn't stop there. Almost immediately, the report arrived of vi victory on Lake Champlain. One enemy frigate, one brig, and two slopes of war had been taken. How could the war go on much longer? People asked each other, Yet, it had been four months since the governor had heard from the delegates' negotiation for peace with England. What was going on? The Madisons moved from Anna's house to what was called the Octagon House, loaned to them by the French ambassador. It was a queer place, not really eight-sided, but six-sided with a bulge 
and it was said to be haunted, not superstitious. The Madisons paid no attention to this kind of talk, yet it was easy to see how much rumors started. In the dining room, a sliding panel led to a secret passage, an underground tunnel. Moreover, some of the former occupants had met with strange accidents that were heard to ex explain. In one family, for instance, there had been two daughters. Both fell in love with men of whom their fathers disapproved. Both girls at different times felt down the fell down the stout fell down the stairs of that house and were killed. Perhaps it was the ghosts of the girls that were supposed to do the haunting. Perhaps it was the lovers, but it wasn't ghosts that bothered James and Dolly. The house was damp and chilly. The rooms were too small to accommodate many people. Yet, of course, Dolly entertained. No matter what, Dolly would always entertain. In October, news finally arrived from the peace delegates. News about Payne, too. All of it was bad. Payne was gambling and leading a wild life in Paris. And although the del delegates tried to persuade him to go home, he kept making up excuses. As for the peace negotiations, the report was that England was acting as if it still owned the colonies and would dictate its demands. Everything north of the Ohio River was to be declared Indian domination, dominion. In other words, not open to American settlements, the Great Lakes were to be given to Canada. Maine was to be handed over to England, but what England most wanted to, was to po possess New Orleans and take control of the West. Indeed, a large expedition had already sailed for New Orleans, so the war stretched ahead. What John Adams had once said was still true. America had to prove to England and France and to its, itself that it was not nothing. Well, they would do it, Madison said.